Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I want to talk to you about coffee adulteration. So I was reading this article from Life Lifeable. Not quite sure. But in any case, it was important because they were talking about coffee adulteration. And many of the adulterants they call out are cereals, so barley, wheat, and corn, sugars, other types of cocoa beans. And generally, the, the point of adulteration is to lower the cost of coffee. So a big date of this is like economic adulteration. And this is really interesting because in the in the article, they go over the types of constituents that are usually found and can be markers for the presence of these adulterants. So different types of sugars, different volatile organic compounds, different fatty acids. And so these markers can help us to differentiate between authentic coffee and coffee that may have been adulterated or blended with some of these other fillers. They also go and provide a list of different techniques that are often used for the detection of these adulterated materials, such as HPLC, which relies on the chemical separation on a column. We have UV Viz, which is a, a visible light technique that can be used to look at the differences in the absorption of these materials, as well as GC for the volatiles mass spec, a very powerful technique for the trace analysis, particularly when you couple that with HPLC. But of course, they also mention various spectroscopy techniques, including near infrared spectroscopy, which we have one of those right here. So why not just give us a shot? Let's do some method development work really quickly to see if we can separate coffee, authentic coffee from these typical types of cereal style fillers. So the corn, the whole grain, the barley. And so fortunately, these are also the, the base ingredients for many different cereals you'd find at home. So this is Kix cereal here. No, this is Chex Mix. We have Kix here. I have Pirate Booty, another cereal with the common corn base. Cheerios also in this bag. And then for our authentic standard, we have some fresh ground coffee in the bag. And because the bag will act as the same type of matrix, I intend to just test these samples in the bag to minimize the probe contamination. When I've looked at coffees before, I've actually just exposed the probe directly to the, the fresh ground coffee, but then I'm constantly having to wipe the probe every few samples. And so it's much easier to keep this surface, this glass clean here, if I just put this on the outside of the material and perform the testing that way. And so let's see if that works well. So to do this, we're going to switch the camera and it appears I need to calibrate the instrument. So this is great. So I've had this instrument on for a while and then it sends me a reminder to calibrate the instrument before running more samples. So let's do that. Calibration again is really simple. I just push this button and point it away from me might be able to see a flash in the background. And then as you can see on the prompt, I will then be asked to place this white surface on top of the device like this. And then I will push the sampling button again. And then it will run the rest of the calibration sequence. And like that, the instrument is recalibrated. We can see that that warning has since gone away and Usually before I start a new project, this is both in the real world and for projects on this channel, I do some method development work. I wanna get an idea of the type of data I should expect from the various materials. This, is, this can give you an idea of how many samples you might need to see uh, significant differences. This can give you an idea on the types of matrix interference that could come into play. For instance, if this bag were, uh, were to interfere strongly with my samples, then I might not be able to use it. I may have to direct measure the samples or come up with some other way to protect this probe. So what we're going to do now is just look at these materials and, and see what they look like. Uh, and then instead of doing a lot of sophisticated processing, I'm just going to download this file, throw it quickly into a notebook I've already made that will just quickly ingest the data, create a scatter plot of, of the PCA results. And we're just going to see if we get two clusters, the idea is to determine if we can use this device to separate coffee from anything else, um, particularly these cereal materials. So I'm just gonna begin testing and you can see it's gonna be pretty straightforward. I'm gonna do this several times and randomly switch between the, the different bags. 
and we will be off to the races. And in this case, I'm not too concerned about trying to, to classify the different serials. That could be a different experiment altogether, you know, especially if we start considering different things like gluten-free and other things, other dietary concerns that might come into play. But I just want to see if I look at a bunch of different cereals and this coffee, do I see a difference? And so I'm going to just continue to measure these samples until I get maybe 15 or 20 and see how they compare against coffee. And just by looking at the data now, we can see that they do seem to have the same general shape. Now, because of the different size of the particles of, of the, the materials themselves, we're going to get different scattering effects. And this is why we do signal processing. This is where S and V comes along quite nicely. And so I'm not going to necessarily know which of these materials will be the coffee when I analyze the data, but it's likely going to be very different from the rest of the samples. So I'm just running these. I'm not going to label them. We're just going to treat this as an unknown analysis and, and just keep it again in this method development phase. And very likely in the future, I will want to include more samples in this study, but let's just use this for now. And we can probably already see which samples might be the coffee because there's their respective spectra look quite distinct from the rest of the materials, but it's still going to be good to build a data driven workflow so that we can measure this difference. We can eventually begin maybe estimating how much we have if we want to begin quantitating the type of impurities. Um, generally for economic adulteration, we're talking large amounts of these fillers so that we can reduce cost. One of the benefits is you can see that even with these bags, we're able to begin differentiating these materials. And so this is why we do this sort of method development work, because I am not worrying about how clean the probe is. I can easily quickly switch between several samples. Um, this would suggest that we could look at other foods this way. There was a, a video I made on the channel a while ago where I was looking at different meats. And in the course of that study, they actually tested through the plastic. So they were at a market and they were testing the different meats through the top of the plastic. And I might choose to do that as I continue to look at various foods. And then this is part of the larger study where we've already looked at plastics. We've looked at several coffees. Now we're looking at different cereals in the context of adulteration detection. Of course, we could look at different teas, different herbs, other things that we might want to measure with this technique. And so we have a lot of data. So what you're seeing now is the iPad on the screen, but I'm, I'm just sharing this image here. And so with this, the data automatically moves to the clouds. So I'll just clear this up a little bit and switch back to my computer screen. And once I refresh this, we will see that all the data that was collected locally will be moved to the, the cloud for the uh, Trinomix system. And so visually we might be able to see that there seems to already be a group of samples that are distinct from the others. And here appears to be the bulk material. So visually we see that we might actually be able to differentiate the various cereals with enough replicas. This is why we just continue to test. And typically we would have done some labeling, but in this case, we're just rapidly figuring out, do we have an approach we can take? And so I, particularly when you look around 5,500 nanometers, it does really appear to be one, two, three, four different materials, even if we were to apply some signal processing. So let's do that. Let's download this data which we can do really easily. So let me go to measurements. Let me change the window to 50. I'm not quite sure how many it took, 26. And I will just select all of the data. And I want to download this as CSV. I typically prefer to look at wavelength. And let's just download that data. And let me minimize this. And all I really want to do, let me just drag this over here all the way is open this folder and let me drag that downloaded file to this folder here. So I'm just gonna copy this path and you'll see why in a second. Let's hide this out the way. So the way I generate this proof of concept notebook is 
by first importing some libraries we commonly use. Uh, of course, I use this Retina format to improve how it looks on the screen. We've got our standard methods that we've used time after time with these near IR data. And in this cell here, I have this input that I'm going to use to just copy the path to the data. And then we're just going to do some quick PCA to see what this looks like. And so let me run this cell and get the kernel going. Let's run this, make sure you have a method. And what I really should do is just make these their own library so that I could just import them instead of calling them like this. And what you see is that for path, I have this input and I can just paste in the path to that data. Now, path is that instrument data that I've just added and it's passed directly into this read CSV. So it's really convenient, particularly for this kind of quick testing. And when we run it, we see we it looks like we do have different groups. We have one group here, a group there, a different group there, and a really tight group here, which I'm guessing is the coffee group. I'm not entirely sure, but because this coffee is so finely ground, I would expect it to be tighter versus the groups that are a little bit more spread out which could be a result of the different particle size for the different cereals. I didn't exactly ground these very precisely, particularly the Cheerios, which I essentially just tried to crush into the bag. Well, we have several different sizes. And so without signal processing, this would be even more extreme, but we've gotten rid of some of that scattering because we have used SNV, but we can already see we can easily differentiate these various cereals and what I'm guessing to likely be the coffee. So what we're going to do next in a, in a different video is actually label these samples, build this out more formally. It's clear we can use the materials in these bags. And so I will also gather other types of materials, other foodstuffs, sugars, flowers, maybe some other types of chips and just see what we can understand. If we look at Pirate's Booty, for instance, we have... Uh, several types of ingredients that could be interesting to observe, such as cornmeal, rice flour, sunflower oil, canola oil, corn oil, and powdered cheese. So there's lots of things that we're going to be able to determine based on this data as we add more samples to this study. And so, yes, I think we can easily separate coffee from these other samples, including if we were to mix them. So we will do that in a different video when I have a way to actually measure how much we have adulterated the coffee and then build a model to predict if the coffee is adulterated, and if so, by how much. In the case, if you wanna follow that journey, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.